20th chapter. And while you're doing that, um, if you're free this week on Thursday evening at 7.30, uh, we'll be at the uh, beloved St. John, Pastor Clement Lupton is having his uh, men's conference Thursday night at 7.30 p.m. If you're in the neighborhood, come on out for and worship the Lord with them that evening. Up to Luke, the 20th chapter, near the end, and I uh, want to go into the 21st chapter, not all the way through it, but a couple blocks of scripture I want to look at. Luke 20, verse 41 to 47 from the New King James Version. And he said unto them, Jesus said unto them, how can they say that the Christ is the son of David? Now David himself said in the book of Psalms, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. Therefore, David calls him Lord. How is he then his son? Then in the hearing of all the people, he said to his disciples, beware of the scribes who desire to go around in long robes love greetings in the marketplaces, the best seats in the synagogues, and the best places at feast, who devour widows' houses for a pretense, make long prayers. These will receive greater condemnation. This is the teachings of Christ still that we see here in the book of Luke. And as the Jewish leaders had attempted to trap Jesus and turn the people against him, Jesus stayed on point and he refused to be distracted by his enemies' trifling questions. And what the religious leaders did not say about Jesus is most significant. They did not say that he was the son of God. Their answer that Jesus was merely the son of David revealed two erroneous ideas that desperately needed correcting. It was absolutely essential that they be corrected. And Jesus had wisely and effectively defeated the religionists' attempts to discredit him. The Lord had answered their questions so wisely and with so much authority that some of the very ones engaged in the plot were impressed. All the religionists, in verse 40, were silenced. They had been crushed and embarrassed because the people that they dared not ask Jesus any more questions. And the first misunderstanding Jesus confronted was that the Messiah was merely David's son. But Jesus made it perfectly clear. He is not just the son of David, not merely born of man. He is the Lord from heaven. Using scripture as his basis, Jesus presented an argument that is both forceful and irrefutable. And David called the Messiah Lord in the Psalms. Verse 42 and 43 says, that is, David's words are recorded in scripture under the inspiration of the Spirit of God. God was directing him as he wrote. So first, Jesus was saying that to think of the Messiah only in human terms 
is totally inadequate. The Messiah is not only man, he is the Lord from heaven. And secondly, Jesus was claiming to be the son of God himself. Man's concept has to go beyond the mere human and physical. God sent his son to earth and sacrificing him in order to save it and all of those within it who would believe in him. Remember, Peter replied, you are the Christ, the son of God of the living God. So our lives do not consist of the things we have, but of the service that we render to others. And Jesus had exposed the religionists for what they really were. The terrible sin of the religionists was that they devoured widows' houses. That is, they exploited widows for gain. And this was and is a gross sin, and it's common. And the fact should be noted here that widows hold a special place in God's heart. He has always instructed his people to care for them in a very special way. And some sins are even more horrible than others. And using religion for selfish ends and taking advantage of others among them. Those who do these things will receive a greater condemnation, a harsher judgment. Does not the word tell us, Father of the fatherless and protector of widows is God in his holy habitation? And then Isaiah says, learn to do good. Seek justice. Correct oppression, bring justice to the fatherless, and plead the widow's cause. Let the people of God say amen and amen. Look there at chapter 21, verses 1 to 4. And he looked up and saw the rich putting their gifts into the treasury. And he also, and he saw also a certain poor widow putting in two mites. So he said, truly I say to you that this poor widow has put in more than all. For all these out of their abundance have put in offerings for God. But she out of her poverty put in all the livelihood that she had. Somebody say thank God for his word. So Jesus had answered the questions about giving and he did so strongly. Without hesitation and debate, every person is to give to meet the needs of a world that has thousands dying every day. And uh, they lack the very necessities of life and have never heard the gospel of God's glorious love and deliverance. And the setting of this scene is the temple where Jesus had been teaching and battling with his enemies. He had suffered a great deal of pressure and tension over the past few hours, and the authorities had baited him time and again with trick questions, trying to trap him and discredit him before the people. And nevertheless, the Lord seized the opportunity to teach this lesson, a vital lesson about giving. He sees... The spirit from which we give. Aren't you glad about that? Oh, I'm so glad man can't look into our hearts to see the spirit which we give as unto the Lord. But God sees us in the inner man. So he heard the clanging of the money being dropped into the collection boxes. And when the Lord looked up, 
He saw what must have been an impressive sight. It was Passover. Getting ready to die that week. And teeming thousands were streaming by the boxes, giving their offerings. And among them were many rich people. And Jesus observed as they made their large contributions. And suddenly, a sharply contrasting scene caught his eye. A poor widow had cast in two copper coins. The smallest coins, the coins that had the least value in that day. And Jesus saw in the widows giving a timely illustration, an illustration that would answer people's questions about giving to the work of God and meeting the desperate needs of the world. And in that day, little work was available for a widow. Poor widows had to struggle for their very survival. Even today, many a around the country are struggling just to survive. I don't know whether you saw it. Even the widows were uh, in Ukraine just being bombed by a wicked leader. Widows with buckets of water in bathrooms trying to live in a place of nowhere to go. But God sees the wicked in their might. Ah, oh my God, they may not come down when we want them to come down, but they're going to give an account unto God Almighty. Somebody shout hallelujah to Jesus. So the generous widow gave sacrificially to God's work because she wanted to give. She, she wanted God to have what she had to use in his service. She did not give grudgingly or reluctantly, but willingly. And her sacrificial gift proved that her trust was not in money. Her trust was in Almighty God. She literally gave all she had to God. Her spirit was right. It was reaching out to God, saying that all she had belonged to him. And both she and her possessions were the Lord. So comparing the widow's two small copper coins to the large contributions from the rich, Jesus made a puzzling statement. He said, this poor widow has put in more than all of them. To be clear, Jesus was not saying that she gave more than any of them, but more than all of them put together. This wasn't shocking. How could he make such a statement? For some had cast in much more money than she, and all the rich combined had cast in enormous sums of money. And very simply, the Lord measured how much was kept back, not how much was given. The widow had less remaining, but the others still had much. The widow had given more of what she had, but the others had given less of what they had. The widow had sacrificed more, but the others had sacrificed less. In proportion to what she had, the widow gave a larger percentage. The others gave a much smaller percent. After they had given, they still had a large percentage of their money to spend on themselves. And Jesus pointed out that the rich gave out of their abundance. They believed in God and trusted God, yes, and they were appreciative of the blessings of God. They were even concerned about the needs and the welfare of God's work, concerned enough to give sizable offerings but it's important to see this fact in order to clearly see what Jesus is saying. The rich were giving and giving much because they cared deeply about the work of God, but their gifts were genuine and large, but they were not sacrificial. When it comes to our giving, God sees more than the portion. He sees the proportion. 
Men see what is given, but God sees what is left. And by that, he measures the gift and the condition of our hearts. Oh, you remember this man, Winston Churchill said, we make a living by what we get, but we make a life by what we give. He may have learned that from Jesus, from the word of God, who says, give and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. How many of you are witness today? That as long as you have been a believer, a Christian, that the more you give, the more God gives to you. I God, don't think all times that it's going to come back in the form of dollars. Sometimes you can be in a position that a dollar bill won't help you. He'll send you help when you need help. He'll send you guidance and direction when you need it. He'll give you favor. When money won't do nothing for you. Oh, he's a good God. Throw up your hands and say, thank you, Jesus. So God's temple, his church had need. The widow, though poor, gave to help the temple carry on the ministry of God. The poor widow had need. She gave, believing God would see to it that she had food and clothing and shelter. And note, it says God saw her. And although we are not told how he did it, we can be sure that he took her under his wing and took care of her. Isaiah says, if you pour yourself out for the hungry and satisfy the desire of the afflicted, then shall your light rise in the darkness and your night will rise as the noonday. Somebody shout hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. Look over and tell somebody, God will take care of you. Oh, hallelujah. I said, God will take care of you. Oh, bless his holy name. Look now at this last group here at verse 5. This is Jesus' teachings, the disciples, about the future. Verse 5, I want to read verse 5 down to verse 19 and look at this a little bit. Verse 5, then as some spoke of the temple, how it was adorned, with beautiful stones and donations. He said, these things which you see, the days will come in which not one stone shall be left upon another that shall not be thrown down. So they asked him, saying, teacher, but when will these things be? And what sign will there be when these things are about to take place? And he said, take heed that you not be deceived. For many will come in my name saying, I am he. And the time has drawn near. Therefore, do not go after them. But when you hear of wars and commotions, do not be terrified. For these things must come to pass. But the end will not come Immediately. Then he said to them, Nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. 
And there will be great earthquakes in various places and famines and pestilences. And there will be fearful sights and great signs from heaven. But before all these things, they will lay their hands on you and persecute you delivering you up to the synagogues and prisons. You will be brought before kings and rulers for my name's sake. But it will turn out for you as an occasion for testimony. Therefore, settle it in your hearts not to meditate beforehand on what you will answer. For I will give you a mouth and wisdom which all your adversaries will not be able to contradict or resist. You will be betrayed even by parents and brothers, relatives and friends, And they will put some of you to death. And you will be hated by all for my name's sake. But not a hair of your head shall be lost. By your patience possess your souls. Before I go into this, I want you to highlight three things that Christ says in this passage. The first one is from the the eighth verse. Don't be deceived. The second one is from the ninth verse. Don't be terrified. And the third one is from the 14th verse where it says, therefore, settle it in your hearts. What does that mean? It means make up your mind that you don't worry. Three things Jesus wants us to be aware of. Don't be deceived. Don't be terrified or afraid. And don't worry. Somebody say amen. So now we should always keep in some matters in mind when looking at the end time. First, in understanding what Jesus said, we have to be very careful not to add or take away from what he says. Both mistakes were made by religionists concerning Jesus' first coming from the book of Matthew. Secondly, a major fact to keep in mind is that the disciples did think, the disciples thought that all three events of which Jesus mentions, Jerusalem's destruction, the Lord's return, and the end of the age would happen at about the same time. So Jesus left the temple went to the Mount of Olives, and there Peter, James, and John had asked him three questions. The first one was, when would the temple be destroyed? Number two, what would be the sign of his coming? And number three, what would be the sign of the end of the age? And the disciples thought that these three events were going to occur at the same time. But Jesus had explained things differently. Actually, the temple would be destroyed first. And then there would be a long period of time before he would return and establish his kingdom on earth is what we saw in Luke, the 19th chapter. So uh, Christ's reply comprises what is called as the Olivet Discourse. 
It's the greatest prophetic sermon that he ever preached. The Olivet Discourse is found, it's found in Matthew 24 and 25. It's found in Mark, the 13th chapter, and it's found here in Luke, the 21st chapter. The gospel tells us that Jesus predicted the future in all four gospels. To some extent, this was expected since he was viewed by the common people of his day as a prophet in line with the prophets of the Old Testament. Some considered him to be the future prophet promised by Moses. So since Luke wrote with the Gentile reader in mind, he omitted some of the strong Jewish elements of the sermon while retaining the essential truths that we must consider and apply. Keep in mind that this was a message. Keep in mind that this was a message that was given to Jews, it was given by a Jew about the future of the Jewish nation. Though there are definite applications to God's people today, the emphasis is on Jerusalem. The emphasis is on the Jews and the emphasis is on the temple. Christ was not discussing his coming for the church. For that can occur at any time. And no signs need to precede it. For the Jews, the word tells us, require a sign. But the church is looking for a savior. Did you hear what I said? The Jews are looking for a sign. You can look for a sign all you want, but the born again, blood washed believer, we're looking for a savior to crack the sky. So the sermon focuses on a period in God's program called the tribulation. When God will pour out his wrath on the nations of the world, many Bible students believe that the tribulation will begin after the Lord comes in the air and takes his church to heaven. My God, even so come Lord Jesus. He will climax with the return of Jesus Christ to the earth, at which time he will defeat his foes and establish his kingdom. However, Jesus gave no timetable. He gave no timetable for these events. He did not say when the three events would occur. What he did give was signs that would occur before the events, signs that would point toward his return and toward the end of Jerusalem and toward the end of the age. It's also important to keep in mind that most of the signs happen all through history. However, there is the difference. This is the difference. The signs are going to increase. Oh, hear me, people of God. The signs are going to increase and intensify right before the end of Jerusalem and the end of the age. So Jesus answered the disciples' questions by discussing topics relating to the future of the nation of Israel. The characteristics, Jesus stated, can be seen in every age. In every age of the church, from the beginning, there have been counterfeit messiahs. All down through time, nothing but phonies rising up. Counterfeit uh, messiahs, national and international upheavals all down through the centuries, religious persecution all down through the centuries. But these things are going to increase and they're going to intensify as the time of Jesus coming draws near. Thomas Campbell, a British poet and educator said, coming events cast their shadows before. Oh, hallelujah. You hear what I said? Coming events 
cast their shadow before, and he was right. There will be, as it says in this eighth verse, religious delusion. In other words, take heed that you be not deceived. And even God's people will be in danger of being deceived. Oh, why? Because so many are listening to so much foolishness. God help me today as I teach this little lesson. So many are listening to YouTube foolishness. Every time a false prophet comes on YouTube with some kind of message that you never heard of, we listen to it. Ain't been to no church in three or four months. Ain't been to no church in a year or two. But every kind of mess that pops up on YouTube, we got to listen to it. And then get on the phone with somebody. Did you hear? Did you hear? What's no, I ain't heard and I don't want to hear because I got my ears tuned to another book. Oh, somebody shout hallelujah to Satan is a counterfeit who for centuries, not just, he didn't just start, for centuries has led people astray by deceiving their minds and blinding their hearts. And Israel was often seduced into the sin by false prophets. And the church has God knows had its share. Of false teachers. So Jesus instructed his followers. He said right there in that word. Do not go after them. Look over and tell somebody. Don't, 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 don't go after them. They're false messiahs. The real messiah has already come. <laughs> and his name is Jesus Christ. The son of God himself. It is he and he alone who has the words of eternal life. Peter stepped in and said, Lord, to whom shall we go? You've got the words of eternal life. So note to whom Christ was speaking. He was speaking to his disciples. Christ's followers can be misled by false teachers and prophets. The word from the book of Mark says false Christs and false prophets are going to arise. And then after they arise, they're going to do great signs and wonders. So as to lead astray, if possible, even the elect. While evil people and imposters will go on from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. Most people are naturally concerned about the future, especially when world events are threatening. Therefore, religious racketeers, they prey on people and take advantage of them. Now in every age, there are those who either claim to be the Christ or claim to know when he will return. These false prophets often use the scriptures to prove their accuracy of their predictions in spite of the fact. Go to book, book of Mark. Trying to teach a Bible school lesson in a, on a Sunday morning service. Go to the book of Matthew. Matthew 24. Matthew 24. Verse 36, they want to approve, they want to prove the accuracy of their predictions in spite of the fact that Jesus clearly stated that nobody, look over and tell somebody, nobody, don't care if it's a radio preacher, don't care if it's a TV preacher, whoever think they got the date and the time, Nobody. Matthew 24. Jesus said it. Jesus said it. I'm going to read it to you because you think I'm telling a story. But of that day.
day, Matthew 24 and 36. But of that day and hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. But as the days of Noah were, so also shall the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking and marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark and knew not until the flood came. You ain't going to know it till you see the sky roll back. Knew not until the flood came and took them all away. So shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. So this is why he tells us, be not deceived is our Lord's admonition. And we must take it to heart. The only sure way to keep our balance in a deceptive world is to do what? Know the word. Know what the scriptures are saying and obey what God tells us to do. And it is foolish and hurtful to become so obsessed with Bible prophecy. See, Bible prophecy is good, but you've got to stay with the Bible to know what you're prophesying about. You can't sit and, and get so deep in your own thinking that you've come up with something yourself because the enemy can sure enough throw some dates to your head. Oh, I, I think that might be a good date. That's the day he's come. No, we done seen that on the radio. We done heard it on our folks sitting by. I don't want to even name the preacher who it was. He was a well-known radio preacher. But time and again, he did it. Oh, the Lord is coming on this day. Well, you just go on to Macy's if you hear somebody giving you a date. Go on and sit down at the mall and have a Chick-fil-A sandwich. Because <laughs> if he does come... What's going to hinder you from going up right where you are having a Chick-fil-A sandwich? Well, if he comes, I'm right here, and bless God, I'll go on up with him. <laughs> oh, my God, you got to be careful who you're listening to now. Church, you, and this pandemic has wreaked havoc on the church of Jesus Christ. So much foolishness. Sitting home, able to come out to the house of God and be with the people of God so you can be taught the word of God in the Bible Institute, sitting and listening to full and taking it in. Taking it in. And many of them don't do nothing but run from one place to another. Oh, they go here for two and a half years. They'll get up and they'll be over here for a year and a half. When they get tired of them because nobody used them and nobody called their name, they'll get up and go someplace else. You better be still. And know who you anchored in. And keep your head and your heart in the word of almighty God. Somebody shout hallelujah. Hallelujah. So people have gotten off into Bible prophecy. Hurtful to become so obsessed with Bible prophecy that we start to neglect. What do you neglect? The practical things of the Christian life. Practical things of the Christian life. That's why we've got to be balanced in everything. It's not all the word, the word, the word, the word, the word. And it's not all prayer, 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 prayer. It's the combining of the two. 
That's how you are become strong in the things of God. The word and prayer are meshed together so that as you meditate in the word of God, the spirit of prayer will come and give you a discerning spirit, give you a discerning heart, give you a praying mind to know the things of God. Somebody shout hallelujah. So in addition, it's easy to be deceived when facing what appears to be in time events. We can be deceived into thinking that certain cataclysmic events are infallible signs that the end is at hand. And too often such events prompt wild guesses about the end time resulting in what discouragement for believers when the end does not come those who are new in Christ others will find though others who have been walking with the Lord for a while they'll come and seek out the young those who are new in the Lord and begin filling their head with stuff. And then lo and behold, they've got a bunch of foolishness. You got to be careful who you're listening to. At various times throughout the church age, people have predicted that the return of Christ and the end of the world were near. And some have set dates for Christ's return. But Jesus warned us against being led astray. Let me run on. There will also be international distresses. Oh my God. Jesus said that wars and earthquakes and pestilences and famines. We're seeing it now. And what is it doing? It's intensifying. It's becoming greater. But they are not by themselves they are not signs of his return. These things have been going on throughout the history of the world. However, during the first half of the tribulation, these events will multiply. They will intensify. And those of you who are Bible students, those of you who meditate this week, meditate on the book of Matthew, the 24th chapter, and Revelations, the 6th chapter. And the events in Matthew, in the book of Matthew, that 24th chapter, Jesus is teaching that whole chapter. And then in Revelations chapter 6, you will see it. What are the events? False Christ, wars, famines, death, martyrs, worldwide chaos. And our Lord's admission to his people is don't be terrified. These things must come to pass and there's nothing anybody can do to prevent them. This does not mean that God's people are submitting to blind fate. Rather, it means they are yielding to the plan of a loving father who works all things after the counsel of his own will. Then it goes on and talks about there will be religious persecution. God, I trust that all of us will be on the other side by the time there's a religious persecution, both official and personal. Of course, there has been religious persecution ever since Cain killed Abel. But Jesus promised that his people would suffer, and that promise holds true today. But the persecution in what? In the end times will be much more severe. And many will give their lives for Christ. We're seeing that over, over in other wicked nations now. We don't even know how many people have been tortured. How many people have been killed for naming the name of Christ. I read one article where every time they see a scripture on a piece of paper, they are so afraid that their government will come in and find them with some type of a word of God in their house. So every scripture they see, they take it and memorize it. We take this book for granted. But every scripture that...
that they can lay their eyes on, they take it and memorize it and hide it in their heart and then they burn the piece of paper that they saw. We're living in some wicked times. Oh my God. So Jesus taught that violence among the nations of the world will occur. It must take place. It must take place. It does not occur because God destines it, but because people's hearts are gripped with evil and greed. World violence can so dominate the news that people are led to believe that the end of the world is at hand. Oh, some of you thought that the earth was going to be smashed to pieces with that thing floating out there. When I, when I saw it, I told Rhonda, was looking at the news, I, I said, well, let it come on. We'll get home to glory faster. <laughs> let it smash right down on our heads and get the heck on out of this world. <laughs> oh, my God. You know, when you know Jesus, you can laugh about some of this stuff. And go on and praise him and glorify him because you know that you're wrapped up. You're tied up. You're tangled up with him. Oh, my God. Hallelujah. And not afraid of who can kill the body. But you fear him who can kill both the body and soul and destroy it in hell. That's who you fear. These old houses of clay are getting out of here. Oh, hallelujah. So the last days. They're going to be marked by unusual astronomical events. There will be terrors or fearful sights and great signs happening in the sky at the end. But very practically, practically, such astronomical happenings occur now. The earth is sometimes darkened by dust from earthly catastrophes such as volcanic eruptions, windstorms, smoke from huge fires. Of course, whatever darkens the sun hides the light of the moon from the earth. Both solar and lunar eclipses occur regularly. The stars, that is, meteorites of varying sizes, fall through space often. The point is, the events of the end time are going to trigger astronomical happenings worldwide. Not just in America, worldwide and universally. Doesn't Mark say... But in those days, after that tribulation, the sun shall be darkened and the moon will not give its light and the stars will be falling from heaven and the powers in the heavens will be shaken. So while many Christians today enjoy freedom from official persecution or even family opposition there are others who suffer greatly for their faith and what our Lord said here is an encouragement to them these things have been going on for centuries however as the coming of the Lord draws near these things will multiply they're going to intensify no matter what our views may be of the coming of the Lord, we all need to heed these three admonitions. Don't be deceived. Don't be afraid. And don't worry. Stand on your feet. Look over and tell somebody, that's why I got peace in my soul. Hey, glory to God. Hallelujah. You know, when you have peace down in your sanctified soul, you can lay down your head on your pillow at night and go on and rest yourself. Be anxious, be worried, be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God and the peace of God. Throw up your hands if you got peace. And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, is going to keep my heart and it's going to keep my mind through Christ Jesus. 
Oh, look over and tell somebody, this world ain't our home. Hallelujah, hallelujah. I said, look over and tell somebody, this world ain't our home. Oh, hallelujah to Jesus. It's not our home. We've got a mansion on the other side. Hey! Where we go walk the streets of gold and bow down and cry, Holy! Holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. You're worthy to receive the praise, the glory, the honor, and the power. In the end, when we see Jesus, it'll be worth it all. If you love him today, lift those hands. If you don't know him, come on to this altar. Come on to this altar and receive him. You're here today. No need to be fearful of the future. God's going to take care of you. He knows the very hairs of your head are numbered. He's going to see that you have food on your table, clothes on your back. A reasonable portion of health and strength. The Lord's going to provide for you. That's why we keep our eyes on him. Not keeping your eyes on people, preachers and apostles and every name you can think they can conjure up. Trying to be great somebodies and they're great nobodies. But you're a great somebody when you live for Jesus. When you confess him and glorify him and want to live for him and honor him. Come on to this altar and be saved today. Get your head in the right place. Get your spirit in the right place. Get your heart in the right place. Let the blood of Jesus, that blood that they sang about this morning, the blood still works. That's why we celebrate it. It still works. The blood will still wash you of sin. The blood will still cleanse you of unrighteousness. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Nobody can do that for you but Jesus. Not some false Messiah, not some false prophet. Nobody but Christ. Christ in you, the hope of glory. He is the one we need to keep our eyes on. Not looking to people, not looking to things. So many people want to get your attention. Just trying to get your attention, to get your ear. So that you can listen to them to hear what they have to say. Listen to what Jesus is saying. Listen to what Christ is saying. How he is trying to make a way for you out of no way. You must be born again. You must be born again. You're not spending eternity with him unless you've been born again. I don't care. Who gets over you and says whatever they want to say over you unless you've repented of your sins? Ask him into your life. That's how you get into eternity. So you can hear him say, Well done. So you can hear your Savior. Say, well done. And the end, it's going to be worth it all. All that the Bible would have said much more because we all want to know. What is it going to be like? What is heaven going to be like? What is eternity going to be like? What is it going to be like when I close my eyes and die? What is going to happen? Jesus told us through the word as much as he gave us.
to be ready. Whenever he would come, whenever he would come and call you, you can be ready and have the assurance of salvation in your heart, in your life. And at the rate that people are dying today, do you hear me? Not only here in deliverance with the number of funerals that we have had, but everywhere, sudden deaths, tragic deaths, not expecting people to die. It's going to intensify. It's going to increase. These houses of clay can't stay here but so long. It's decaying while we're looking at it. It's getting wrinkled while you're sitting there. Vision is getting dimmer. Brain is getting duller. Oh, it's working. It's working its way back to the dust. From generation to generation, we have seen it. And we've got to be ready. Old saints used to say we've got to be ready to walk in Jerusalem. Just like John. <laughs> what a day that's going to be. I'm so glad you've come. Look at these young people. Put these hands together. God, keep our young people everywhere. Those who are saved, keep our young people from so much worldliness, from so much foolishness, so much ungodliness in this age. Said it here the other night. Can't even look at a, at a gospel program. They got to come and shake and move. They got to wear skirts up to their backside and blouses as low as they can to sing the gospel. To sing the gospel of Jesus Christ. Thinking that you've got to show off your flesh to sing about Jesus is foolishness. But this is the age we're in, and it's going to intensify, going to multiply. But you who know the Lord, stay on track and keep your mind on him. Put those hands together. I'm so glad you're here today. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Glory be to God. <laughs> Let me hold it. This is what has our attention. I'm not picking on you, baby. <laughs> Did you record the message? Oh, my Lord. Somebody say praise the Lord. <laughs> she recorded the message. Somebody say praise the Lord. God bless you, honey. But you know what I want you to do with this? During the week, I want you to go on Bible Gateway. Pull that up. And put that app on your phone. So that during, when you first get up in the morning, instead of looking at all the other stuff, look at Bible Gateway and read a scripture for the day. Come on, and God bless you. God bless you. <laughs> Come on and say this prayer with me. Say, oh God, forgive me of my sins and wash me in the blood of Jesus Christ. Save my soul and become Lord and master 
of my life. I ask it in Jesus' name to his glory. Now say thank you for saving me. God bless you, honey. God bless you, young man. God bless you, honey. God bless you, honey. You come back again here. And <laughs> God bless you each and every. Come on and put those hands together and give them a great big God bless you. Let this be your church home. Let all of these be your family members now. Amen. Put those hands together. Oh, hallelujah. Come on and follow this man. He's going to give you some literature and let you come right back. Hallelujah. Come on, deacons. Father in heaven, we thank you for the price you paid on Calvary that we might have life abundant and life eternal. Oh, breathe upon each one of us today. Take our minds to Calvary, for we indeed do love you for all that you have done for us, all that you are to us, and all that you will be to us. And all the saints of God said amen. And amen.